Okay, everyone, hello, and welcome to today's webinar, COVID-19, Keeping Up with a Moving Target. Um, I'm Faith. I'm a program manager at DKD Med, and I will be your moderator today. Here's the CME information. Um, this program is jointly provided by the Postgraduate Institute for Medicine, as well as DKD Med. For complete accreditation information, please visit our website. The learning objectives are as follows. Discuss symptoms trans and transmission of COVID-19. Discuss risks, management, and precautions associated with COVID-19. And describe the natural history of COVID-19 illness. And I want to thank very much DKB Med, uh, the Post Institute, uh, Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, also the Institute for Johns Hopkins Nursing, Archimedex and Free CME, all for their uh, generous support for putting together this program, which I think uh, will be very uh, hopefully useful on many points for both you and your patients. Now, I, I labeled this a moving target because, as you might imagine, there's a torrent of information both in the press and emerging scientific literature, and I think there's often feelings of being whipsawed about. Uh, and what I've tried to do today in these next 20 to 30 minutes is present what I think is credible information. I'll try to also let you know when there's uncertainties and um, and and some guesses as well. Uh, so first, I'll have a picture here, which is merely an electron micrograph of coronavirus. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, the name was taken from the protein spikes that emerge from the uh, viral lipid envelope that do resemble a crown, hence corona. And uh, these viruses have been with us for a very long time. Uh, in fact, there are four routine respiratory coronaviruses that go by uh, the not very memorable names such as uh, HKU2 and so on. Uh, and these four have been circulating for some time. They can cause respiratory disease uh, primarily in children, but really anyone. And this little study I have here is just from last year, but I thought it was representative because it was done in Norway. And about 10% of uh, children who are hospitalized for respiratory infections uh, had coronavirus, although most were under two years old. Interestingly, 10% of asymptomatic controls in this population also shed coronavirus, and a substantial number had co-infections with other viruses, which is very much seen in the pediatric population. And I think uh, how uh, the coronaviruses here behave in this setting, we don't know for sure with the uh, new coronavirus, that is the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus, which causes the disease COVID. But uh, these have been sort of taken as children potentially being transmitters of the virus, asymptomatic, and hence one of the reasons uh, schools have been one of the targets for closure. Can we take anything from these circulating coronaviruses? In many countries, they are seasonal uh, with the wintertime predominance, often in the Northern Hemisphere, but other countries, including uh, subtropical regions such as Thailand, they're year round. So uh, how uh, the novel coronavirus will behave is really quite uncertain. Now, there's been uh, some a rather rapid progress, I would say, in terms of understanding this virus through genomic sequencing. And it does look like this virus uh, did emerge uh, probably from bats. Uh, it is very closely genetically related. Uh, initially, there were suspicions in China and Wuhan City, the epicenter of this current pandemic, uh, that it uh, uh, came about in a fish market. This probably is not true, but there is a concern that the penchant uh, for uh, trading with wild and exotic animals uh, may be the way how this zoonotic disease has leapt. Uh, one of the interesting animals that has come out is a pangolin seen here. 
I was not very familiar with this creature. And for you trivia uh, uh, aficionados, the pangolin is the only scaled mammal on the planet. So I think there'll be more to learn. But all the SARS viruses have thought to have jumped uh, from animals where there are many circulating coronaviruses to humans that includes the original SARS in 2002-2003, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, MERS, COVID, and now our current SARS-2 coronavirus. One of the earliest papers published online in January in the New England Journal uh, showed what I think no one thought was unexpected in patients with severe pneumonia with the coronavirus in panel B, that uh, this uh, virus seemed to very much target human airway epithelial cells in its lining. And uh, because symptoms emerge so quickly after infection, uh, this is really uh, probably mostly due to direct viral effects. Uh, and uh, this virus being uh, the taking over of host cells and co-opting usual cellular machinery. This slide merely shows some relationships uh, between the uh, SARS-CoV-2 in red and it gives you some idea of the distance between the MERS uh, coronavirus and also the uh, SARS coronavirus um, and is most closely related to uh, uh, known circulating bat coronaviruses. The panel on the right shows a uh, epithelial uh, cell culture, human cell culture, and just how this virus can cause so-called cytopathic effect, meaning it uh, lyses the uh, cells and uh, this may be some of the earlier signs of damage. There are many sources to go to for information. Uh, I'm from Johns Hopkins, and this particular map and display has gotten a lot of attention um, as it has been put together and trying to synthesize worldwide information. Uh, as many of you know, the cases worldwide have now outstripped those originally uh, seen in China, as well as, unfortunately, the deaths. But this can give you some uh, uh, really real-time information on the status of confirmed uh, cases of the planet. It's, it's quite remarkable and requires some work and synthesis uh, by computers. Now, I do want to take a moment on transmission. Uh, there's still some uh, debate here, but the thought is most of this novel coronavirus is transmitted by droplets. And characteristically, this could be an unprotected sneeze with larger uh, sizes where uh, the travel is at best three to six feet. Now, um, there's probably fomite transmission and surface contamination. Um, a recent uh, article with this novel coronavirus uh, has uh, pretty much mimicked what was seen with MERS, CoV, and SARS, is that under somewhat ideal conditions, it can survive for up to three days on metal or plastic uh, at a controlled 40% humidity. Extremes in humidity or temperature significantly reduce the viability of this virus uh, to cause infection. Fabric seems to be less in the six to 12 hour range. Cardboard, probably 12 hours, but again, in ideal conditions. One of the issues is uh, airborne uh, transmission. Um, this probably can occur, but in certain settings where you may nebulize secretions or in hospitals, uh, perhaps, uh, where there should be greater caution. And there are some lessons learned in this regard. So for the moment, um, I'd like to just make a note of other infections. And some of you may be familiar with the r naught, and that is... If you have the infection, how likely are you as an infected person to transmit it? And uh, you can see on the top what uh, was for pandemic influenza and probably seasonal influenza as well, uh, an R factor of under two, a droplet transmission, a case fatality rate of under 0.1%, but people with comorbidities at higher risk. For the other uh, coronaviruses that have caused trouble in uh, past years, 
um, uh, SARS coronavirus and MERS, uh, there has been variable transmission rates. They've been believed to be mostly droplet with higher case fatality rates, but also people with comorbidities faring uh, worse. SARS-2 COVID has ranged anywhere from 1.4 to 6.6 on earliest estimates. And also coronaviruses have always had this odd feature of having some patients being super spreaders. For example, uh, one woman with the novel coronavirus in South Korea uh, was able to effectively uh, uh, transmit to 35 people. Now, um, I, I don't, didn't have time to update this slide for information that just came out from Imperial College that looked at the early Wuhan experience, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But because they've been so aggressive with central quarantine, the initial uh, estimates of the r naught. Uh, early on in the epidemic were 3.66, but with central quarantining, and that means taking uh, screening patients aggressively with molecular testing and then cohorting them in uh, these large tents and hospitals, uh, effectively removing them from communities brought the r naught rather rapidly down to 0.3, and of course was able to terminate the local epidemic. I also have some other pathogens on here, measles, Ebola, and so on, for comparison uh, that uh, you might find informative if you come back. Now, uh, as healthcare workers, I think we are at highest risk than any other group, except perhaps uh, first responders as well, uh, for potential infection. And uh, therefore, the Centers for Disease Control has taken uh, a, a very conservative approach, even though this may be predominantly droplet precaution, uh, they would like to use airborne when possible for hospitalized patients. However, this has been relaxed in the face of difficulties uh, obtaining necessary equipment uh, with droplet with uh, facial protection uh, if, uh, 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 if uh, certain uh, healthcare facilities no longer are able. But it's been true that in Wuhan that healthcare workers who covered their um, their uh, face and hair as well as eyes and uh, really took care with uh, double gloving and wearing gowns uh, were not infected once they took those measures in terms of treating many, many patients. So taking care uh, to not uh, become infected is very important. The WHO has adopted the droplet precautions, which many of you may be familiar with uh, in terms of um, taking care of influenza patients in the past, uh, but to uh, suggest uh, airborne precautions with aerosol generating procedures. So I think, uh, again, caution is probably most important and will depend a little bit on what your resources are and your particular settings as well. Now, a lot of the preliminary information has come from China with a number of reports published in journals that really uh, were no more than um, a case series, and we are learning more and more as this pandemic evolves. There's clearly a range of illness. Um, best estimates are that perhaps 80% or more of people uh, uh, um, mild to moderate illness or even asymptomatic. The older you are, clearly the more you are at risk of developing symptomatic disease. Uh, the incubation period seems to average between five to six and a half days based on a number of reports with a range from two to 12 days, although now there are reports up to 27 days, but I think take these with some caution because there could be other exposures as well. Uh, the initial experience of 10 in China to say that more men than women were infected with a age, um, a mean age in their 50s. Uh, and um, some of the early Wuhan experience had uh, rates that were uh, fairly high, but then lower as the epidemic moved on. Now, uh, a lot of the what we know so far are limited to hospitalized patients, so patients that um, are more um, 
that are more uh, severely ill. Fever seems to be a common characteristic, although a report was just published in Clinical Infectious Diseases that said that people that were presenting with severe respiratory illness at the door, um, about 15% of people lacked fever. So I think uh, that is not something that should be exclusionary. Uh, the cough when present is usually dry along with flu-like symptoms such as myalgia or fatigue. Uh, patients that do present with shortness of breath in about a third, and this does seem to be common, and of course, here in the United States, in fact, many are recommending as a triage to only go to emergency departments when uh, there's complaints of dyspnea. There's a host of less common symptoms that may be actually more common in younger people that would represent an upper respiratory tract infection or even head congestion. Uh, GI symptoms, much like an in influenza, can be seen as well. Uh, these uh, descriptions with sicker patients, about 70% had a depressed white count, and LDH levels are also often elevated. Now, imaging is interesting because uh, before there was a testing, chest CTs uh, did suggest in the setting of a epi local epidemic that ground glass infiltrates correlated very highly with subsequent uh, COVID testing. Um, this does progress to uh, adult respiratory distress syndrome uh, with a lung injury. Um, with uh, peak findings about 10 days after onset of illness. And then if uh, people survive, resolution is uh, after 14 days. The pathogenesis of that severe ARDS uh, is probably similar to viral ARDS. And we're only beginning to learn about this, but looks like it causes a lung injury with fibrosis and is probably due to um, dysregulation uh, amongst regulatory T cells. Uh, rather than the neutrophilic and macrophage activation seen in garden variety ARDS caused by sepsis. Diagnostics have been a huge bottleneck, unfortunately, here in the United States. Um, this is now improving, um, and uh, the FDA had been cautious because they wanted to make sure that tests were clinically validated before authorizing to avoid some of the false positive and false negative uh, results that uh, we hear are coming out from some of the countries with earlier widespread testing experience. Um, here in the United States, the Centers for Disease Control does have an RT. Uh, PCR diagnostic panel that uh, health departments and states are using, uh, but the FDA has liberalized as well along with state health departments now to allow testing not only in commercial labs, but hospitals that have developed their homebrew tests. Uh, here at Johns Hopkins, we do at the moment because we're still a, a bit limited to testing, uh, but ramping up, we are doing a reflex first with influenza and RSV, uh, which if it's positive, we don't proceed to uh, COVID testing. Uh, but if that's negative, we will then run the COVID testing. And this, this very much may change. Uh, serology is going to be very important because it's limited us to uh, proper understanding of um, how many people are uh, infected to get uh, really better denominators on the infection and understanding how often severe disease occurs and in whom. Uh, so amongst hospitalized patients, at least from the Chinese experience, about half developed low oxygen by day eight and ARDS in almost a third. ICU patients, you can see, uh, uh, often required uh, assistance and ventilation, and some were put on extra corporeal membrane oxygenation, but uh, so far the results with ECMO have um, not been quite as good uh, as one would have hoped. And this also was some of the experience seen with other viral related ARDS such as influenza. Now the early Wuhan experience uh, had a mortality, case fatality rate of 4.3%. Uh, it, it was lowered over time and Again, I just read some information today from Imperial College, which is re in the United Kingdom, which is re reanalyzing with Chinese colleagues the Chinese data. So it looks like uh, accounting 
uh, for uh, illnesses there. The case fatality rate in Wuhan um, and China was 1.38%. So that was the overall. And their estimates are if you combine it with asymptomatic infections, the rate is 0.66%. So Again, worse than seasonal influenza, perhaps six times worse uh, than seasonal influenza, uh, maybe higher up to 10 times. Uh, but uh, this information, I think, is not surprising, especially if we can get more information uh, uh, on the denominator with serology. Uh, that Imperial College data, though, is clearly age skewed. So people with comorbidities and older had much higher rates, higher mortality rates. So the overall rates, um, uh, not that they're reassuring, but they're not quite as shockingly high as originally described, but uh, still a cause for concern in vulnerable populations. Uh, this information is displayed here in tabular form, which gives you an idea that the older you are, it is clearly, uh, unfortunately, bad news. And I think many of us have heard this information already. Children, especially under 10, seem to be at very low risk um, for dying uh, or serious illness. Uh, but uh, even uh, healthy young adults are at risk. And I think this is important to tell people because younger people, I think, have gotten the message that they're immune and don't need to proceed with social distancing and so on. Cardiovascular disease is one of the uh, greatest apparent risk factors, along with diabetes, lung disease, uh, hypertension, and cancer. And we'll get back to um, cancer momentarily. I'm sorry, back to hypertension in a moment. In terms of therapeutics, of course, supportive care. Um, and amongst the investigational drugs, remdesivir uh, from Gilead has been most in the news. It was developed as an anti-Ebola drug, uh, but was less effective than monoclonal antibodies against Ebola, but had a good activity when studied against MERS and SARS in the test tube. And in primate experiments against MERS-CoV, uh, uh, was effective at reducing illness when given to these um, macaques 12 hours following viral inoculation and were completely preventative if given prophylactically. Now, it is a parenteral drug, so not really probably uh, a role for prophylactic use, and uh, information is still awaited. Uh, some preliminary data uh, from the U.S. experience, compassionate use is not very good, but I would tell you if this works as an antiviral, it should probably be given as early as possible, just like we do with oseltamivir, uh, to have an effect as an antiviral. There's a whole host of other agents under study, and um, uh, if you look at the uh, Chinese clinical trial website, as well as clinicaltrial.gov, as well as in the UK, uh, and I'll just try to note a few of these. Uh, uh, lipinavir, ritonavir, known as Kaletra, an HIV drug, is a protease inhibitor that uh, looks like it has some in vitro activity against one of the proteases in coronavirus um, and was trialed with uh, SARS. Uh, there has been difficulties obtaining it in the United States uh, because production of this HIV drug, which is no longer popular, was reduced. Uh, virologists have told me that the uh, inhibitory concentration of this drug is 100 times less than against HIV. Um, there are clinical trials from China pending and has been incorporated by some um, uh, hospitals in countries as part of their treatment. Uh, but there's yet no convincing data that any drug um, is effective yet. So a clear message that um, as we move through these drugs, I just want to be clear, the, there are hints and often small and early trials or in vitro uh, activity do not translate. Another drug that is a set of drugs that have gotten a lot of press is chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. These are anti-malarials. Hydroxychloroquine also used as an anti-inflammatory by rheumatologists for rheumatoid arthritis and so on. The thought is that these drugs uh, interfere with cellular acidification, reducing Fig lysosomal uh, pH, and therefore interrupting uh, viral cell fusion or glycosylation. 
uh, with the uh, receptor, which is the ACE2 receptor for the SARS-CoV-2. Um, there were some reports of efficacy uh, with COVID pneumonia so far uh, that have been reported in press, uh, but have not yet been um, seen with chloroquine. Uh, so we only have press releases that said that it led to faster lung imaging resolution and viral shedding. Uh, there have been in vitro effects uh, with other coronaviruses uh, and mixed uh, with MERS-CoV. Now, um, additionally, uh, we only have in vitro data in some animal models so far with other coronaviruses. We have yet to see any quality uh, COVID published experience, although just uh, today was an early pre-publication from DDA Raoult from France on a small series of patients there who received hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin and uh, were said to have showed uh, significant early reductions in viral shedding. Uh, so that's Raoult, R-A-O-U-L-T, DDA, and if you just uh, type in both uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, you'll likely find that on PubMed or on searches. So um, I would say from a very informal survey, some centers are using these for their patients, others not, based on early this early knowledge. There are cardiotoxicities with hydroxychloroquine, and chloroquine itself has greater cardiotoxicity and is somewhat harder to find in the United States at the present time. Um, as the viral uh, 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 infection progresses, it does cause uh, lung damage that can be irreversible, uh, unfortunately, and uh, that seems to be the case based on preliminary autopsy studies uh, in Asia. Uh, there have been a report of two uh, lung transplants uh, that were performed because of severe lung disease. Uh, the, the lung injury syndrome has brought about the concept that perhaps immunomodulators would be helpful uh, in this situation. Uh, the China guidelines have suggested that uh, the cytokine storm uh, may be targeted, and so their guidelines suggest people with extensive lung disease, severe illness, and elevated IL-6 levels could receive drugs that inhibit interleukin-6. Uh, they use tocalizumab, uh, which is available in the United States. There's another drug as well marketed. Um, and uh, the FDA indications for tocalizumab in particular, you see there, but also include a CAR T cell induced pneumonitis and cytokine release syndrome uh, in oncology patients. And uh, so it actually is FDA approval for that, which was, I think, one of the ra rationales for employing this drug. But there's no, again, quality data to really support its reuse. And I'll warn everyone that it also has a black box warning um, uh, before COVID, of course, was known that it can cause severe bacterial infections, including pneumonia. Um, so uh, any off-label FDA approved drugs for COVID, their stand of effectiveness to date. They're trying to make best judgment and guidance uh, for patients based on really minimal information. I think we always have to be cautious uh, that doing something may not always be in the best interest of our patients beyond supportive care. I have listed here what the Chinese uh, COVID uh, guideline list includes, which is chloroquine. There's also an anti-influenza drug for the advanced lung disease, and of course, traditional Chinese medications. One thing that has uh, been bandied about in the press and uh, looked at closely by scientists is the viral receptor that this virus uses. And the thought is that this ACE2 a uh, cellular component may be a reason why there's uh, um, lung-induced injury. And uh, there's some mixed data that uh, has come out in rodent models that um, some have said that if you stop using ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, that this is said that using it is protective. So there's quite mixed data, which is why I think at the moment, although people are mining uh, EMRs for information and we know hypertension is a risk factor, it's completely unclear whether these medications, which are so widely used for hypertension, have a role. 
And so the advice is not at the moment to make any changes. And this is just some additional information about how uh, uh, there's certain uh, blockages uh, by protease inhibitors that may uh, also be invoked uh, as well via this ACE2 receptor. Just yesterday, or I, I'm sorry, earlier this week on Monday, uh, was the first uh, patient enrollments in a um, U.S. sponsored vaccine trial using a message RNA approach, which is not been available uh, commercially yet, uh, but has been studied uh, for other viruses moving ahead as a phase one safety trial through uh, in the Pacific Northwest through Kaiser Permanente. Main goals are for safety and immune response. And although this is moving quickly, unfortunately, vaccine um, uh, arrival for general public use is many months away. Um, as I mentioned before, there's lots of information out there, people trying to be helpful. Um, I can't tell you how many times I saw a UNICEF PowerPoint slide deck saying that if you ate ice cream three times a day, it would help protect you against the virus. Um, this is all uh, information that please tell your family and friends to be cautious. Don't send it around. Uh, and even the Hopkins um, map um, we've had to issue a press release that it's been co-opted on a false uh, web uh, URL uh, with a Trojan horse to insert malware into your computer. So these things still continue, unfortunately. Um, many of you are, have been aware of the movie Contagion, uh, which actually Ian Lipkin, a virologist, helped advise and talked about an r naught of 2 and a high case fatality rate, but didn't really get it right on the math numbers. But I think as many of us look here to try to see what we can all do to protect ourselves, uh, anxiety and fear, of course, does spread faster, especially with the Internet now more than ever than the vir virus itself. Uh, so something to keep in mind. Uh, what are we doing? There's a range. Uh, obviously, Italy and China have taken a more draconian approaches uh, than we are here at the time being. But it does look like social distancing and uh, uh, early interventions do slow the spread. The reason is that uh, we don't overwhelm our health system, although there's great debate uh, about that. Um, at the moment by uh, many people, but the feeling is given the lack of an antiviral or vaccine, what we can do is essentially have tools that give personal protection to as many people as possible. On the left, you'll see the experience in Italy, where um, in Northern Italy, uh, Lodi took early interventions and lockdowns and blunted the rise compared to another city. And uh, there's a, a CDC estimate, as you can see there, uh, where we would uh, exceed system capacity for helping care for ill patients uh, without uh, such uh, measures. So in summary, uh, uh, you know, uh, please, uh, uh, information that I've said today may change uh, very dramatically. Uh, so uh, it's important to try to stay abreast if you can and look at reliable websites. Um, uh, I think we need to cooperate with one another and, and also hopefully uh, collaborate, which I think is beginning uh, and has been sort of, in my view, more difficult than during the SARS, the original SARS episode in 2002, 2003. Um, and this seems more um, disjointed, and I'm hoping that we'll come together and act more cooperatively. Uh, it's clear this virus is worse than seasonal influenza, hence the reasons and the rationale, as I explained. And a debate exists about societal and economic impacts versus medical. Uh, and uh, we really don't know how this will play out and may be with us for, for uh, weeks yet. But the first question is, if I test positive, when is it safe to return to work? I'll tell you what we're recommending. Uh, we're recommending uh, 72 hours after uh, a cessation of fever 
and all respiratory symptoms without using cough suppressant or antipyretics. Um, in the hospital for patients, we need two sequential negative COVID uh, nasopharyngeal uh, PCRs, uh, but uh, this is not practical at this time for workers uh, necessarily. Uh, some may be trying to screen and uh, we're beginning to get some viral shedding and other studies. So I think with testing uh, ramp up, uh, we'll be able to get people perhaps back sooner as we gain more knowledge. But that's the, uh, that's, uh, I think many people are making those kind of recommendations. Okay, then our next question is, are we worried about antigenic direct with coronavirus? I, I think with any RNA virus, you know, RNA polymerases are by nature, uh, <laughs> uh, there's infidelity uh, compared to DNA viruses. So that's possible. And one of the reasons why there may have been a jump from animals to humans, um, maybe it was just exposure to animals and acquisition, but unclear. I think it is possible uh, that remains a, a concern. I know uh, there are groups working on vaccines that might have more pan-coronavirus uh, effect. What we know is that if you are exposed to one coronavirus, such as one of the pedestrian coronaviruses or even MERS, it doesn't uh, connote that you're immune to other coronaviruses. So it seems to be very strain-specific or very coronavirus specific. So a pan coronavirus, I think, would be wonderful because uh, we've already had SARS, we have had MERS, and, and now we have COVID. So I, I think uh, there's a potential for this happening again. It seems to be about every 10 years uh, or so. So uh, it'd be lovely not to go through this again. Of course, a targeted vaccine is probably fine for now, but I, I think there's much interest in developing a more general coronavirus vaccine. Okay, great. Um, next question is, do we know yet how long we need social distancing to be effective based on incubation periods and how long patients shed the virus? Yeah. So the Wuhan experience, as you know, uh, the early and upward phase of the ep epidemic was um, through January. And then uh, in uh, late January through February were the dramatic changes. And, and it really has come down over six to eight weeks, which is why I think you've heard the CDC really talking about a um, an eight week time frame uh, at a minimum. Uh, I think that's where you had central quarantine, you had identification and tracing of patients. Here we're uh, taking social distancing, but not uh, to the degree uh, that was done in either a Wuhan or we'll see what the effect is in Italy. So it may be longer. Next question is, do you feel ACE inhibitors and ARBs are likely to worsen outcome with COVID-19 or could possibly be protected? Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, it's an excellent question, which I think no one has the answer to. Infectious disease people, virologists, I would say it's quite uncertain. There are no recommendations to change medications at all. Um, I would tell you that there is much interest in data mining EMRs um, here in the United States, especially on the West Coast, uh, as well as in other countries to get a sense if ACE or ARB drugs or perhaps other antihypertensives somehow may be a risk factor, um, which uh, I think would be, you know, of importance. But even then, uh, it would be uh, questionable, but it could give an early clue. So I think you have to stay tuned here for sure. Okay, great. Thank you. Next question. Um, is there a recommendation to not use aspirin or anti-inflammatory medication? Mm -hmm. So just, I think, today, a French group, uh, the French uh, health ministry, uh, based on a Lancet report, said, please don't use ibuprofen. I haven't had a time to look at this paper closely. Uh, so there is some thought that perhaps interfering with uh, some of the uh, 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 endogenous pyrogens or other may somehow impact control of the virus. 
uh, uh, the French ministry is said to use paracetamol, which is essentially acetaminophen, and not to use ibuprofen. Uh, I Unfortunately, I haven't had time to look at that. That is something uh, that I think I don't know uh, yet on what information it's based and so on and so forth. But um, that may be information that if uh, recommended elsewhere, I think for the time being, if, you know, there's always been controversy. Do you, is lowering the fever good for our patients regardless of infection? I mean, it is the disease um, modifying agent of our immune system, right? And the higher the viral temperature, the likely it doesn't like to replicate as much. So um, uh, personally, I tough it out and let your fever do the work. Okay, great. Next question. Um, can you speak to any current studies or information available that describes how COVID-19 can affect pregnant women and their fetus? Yeah, there's really scant information on pregnancy, uh, whether it's uh, this coronavirus is teratogenic or uh, has uh, uh, bad outcomes for pregnancy otherwise. Uh, we know from influenza uh, that that Pregnancy is one of the absolute highest risk factors for having um, severe influenza disease. Um, so uh, I think people have been very cautious. It's not clear that's the case with coronavirus, but I would say anyone that's um, pregnant, I would be cautious and consider yourself in a high-risk group, although it's not absolutely clear that you are part of that qualified group. Next question, why is cardiovascular disease a risk factor for COVID-19? Yeah, we don't know. Uh, so uh, people have brought up whether it's the ACE2 receptor that the virus uses. Um, there have been some suggestions of patients with severe illness that it's not only lung injury, but there could be either a myocarditis or a tendency for heart failure, a critical illness heart failure. That may be a component. Um, also, many people that are older have cardiovascular disease. Uh, so um, it's clear that age, I think, is the gradient that causes more severe illness greater likelihood of acquiring illness, symptomatic illness, and, and unfortunately death. So uh, whether whether that's outside of, car whether cardiovascular disease is an independent risk factor, so for example, is probably true to some degree. I mean, a 25 year old with uh, a dilated cardiomyopathy may be at increased risk just as that person is for influenza, but not clear uh, if if age is actually playing more of a risk factor at this time. Question, is history of cancer or cancer in remission considered a comorbidity? Yeah, so from the Chinese experience, cancer, um, probably it's active cancer, cancer undergoing treatment or recent cancer. I don't think it would be considered a remote history of cancer. Uh, not exactly clear to me until we see uh, uh, more studies. Uh, of course, people with a history of cancer often are older. Uh, so we do have to be careful when you look at studies in this regard. Thank you, Dr. Allwater. I wanted to take pause for a moment. Um, one, to let everyone know the slides will be available um, after this as well as that this program, is, uh, I acknowledge some technical difficulties, uh, some questions coming in about those. Uh, we will have this program available as an enduring program after for you to view. Um, so thank you for that. Dr. Alward, how many more questions do you think you'll be able to answer for us today? Um, well, I, I have that we probably have about four to five more minutes, so maybe two or three more. Okay. If you've been infected, is there any information about immunity to reinfection? Yes. So a paper just came out uh, that looked at um, antibody conversion. Uh, we know from other coronaviruses, you generally don't get infected again. For example, if you've had MERS and survived, you don't get MERS again. Uh, so 
It looks like if you've only been sick for five or seven days, it's unlikely you have antibody generation. Uh, but by uh, two to three weeks after onset of illness, most people will have IgM and or IgG antibodies. Um, it does look like they're neutralizing in early studies, so would be protective. I think this is important because once we get a validated serological test, people that may have only had minor illnesses, respiratory illnesses this winter, starting in February, March, April, moving ahead, uh, if they are uh, testing the blood, then it, it may well be that they can consider themselves immune, just like if they had had a vaccine, and that would be very useful, help quell anxiety, and also uh, people that could probably lend a hand uh, more easily without being as concerned about acquiring